You're listening to Wordslinger Podcast, episode 69, Writing Fantasy with Garrett Robinson. Writing a book. It can be the best way to build or grow your business, or to simply tell the story that you wish to tell. Learn how to write your book in 30 days or less. Pick up 30 Day Author today from Amazon, Apple iBooks, or other online retailers. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tumlinson, the Word Slinger. Word Slinger. Hey, everybody, this is Kevin Tumlinson, the Word Slinger. I think I may be the only word slinger on the planet. Who knows? Maybe there's someone else out there just kind of, you know, claiming the name. Who knows? <laughs> Although you can be a word slinger too. Uh, if you want to get into writing every day, uh, I got the book for you. Check out, and I advertised it at the beginning of the show, I know, but here we go again. Check out 30 Day Author where you can learn a daily writing, writing habit. Not a daily speaking habit, clearly, uh, but a daily writing habit. And even learn how to write your book in 30 days or less, uh, or whatever time frame you like. That's what that book's all about. It's about teaching you how to have a daily writing habit, mostly. Um, and I give you a few pointers on how to actually, uh, you know, publish a book, market a book, that sort of thing. So it's geared, all, it's geared really towards uh, the entrepreneur who wants to to uh, add a book to their marketing and uh, branding strategy. Uh, but I also have some tips in there for the fiction writer and. If you are interested in a career in fiction, you're going to love today's interview. <laughs> See the segue there uh, with uh, fiction author Garrett Robinson. He's a best-selling fiction author. He's the author of the Nightblade uh, series, the number one fantasy series on Amazon. So you're going to enjoy this show with uh, Garrett. He's another one that I met at the, uh, the the Colony Summit back in April 2015. Um I don't think I've fully mined all of that yet. I, I'm getting close, though, because, I mean, I think half my guests over the past six months have come out of that um, summit. So, And I know they're going to have another one, uh, and they're calling it something else now. It's the Smarter Artist Summit, which, sadly, I will miss, but uh, and which is too bad. I really would actually have enjoyed being there, and I think it's going to be a huge event and probably very uh very useful for anyone attending so if you happen to have the time and the cash you should check that out the smarter artist summit from the the guys who bring you uh self-publishing podcast those three guys johnny sean and dave i've had two of them uh johnny and sean on this show and garrett actually is working closely with them uh he's heading their uh their uh fantasy imprint now so you're going to hear all about that in today's episode before we get into that just A brief bit of housekeeping, Um, I do have a a newly updated uh, Patreon campaign, and I do have a lofty goal. I want to try to uh, generate about five grand a month for the show so that I can afford to to outsource some of the production, but also so that I can grow the show with some of the plans I have for it. So every little dollar you can uh, send my way will help. So if you are, you know, if you are enjoying the show, if you are getting a lot out of the show. I'd love it if you'd help support it. Just go to um, wordslingerpodcast.com, click on the Patreon logo, and uh, if you're on any given Wordslinger podcast episode, there's a there's a big giant button on the uh, on the home page there, or well on the home page, but also on each individual post. So you can go and uh, as little as a buck a month uh, would be very handy. Um, that's like a quarter per episode actually. (laughs) So, uh, any amount you decide to give would be fantastic. And to those who are already giving, I really appreciate you. Um, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to, to, I, I, the great thing about that is I'm I'm starting to interact with some people who are interested in promoting, uh, helping the show actually supporting the show. Um, in other ways that you can help support the show, buy the books. Uh, th- those are really kind of the point of all this. That's why I do all this. Uh, I, as I said, you can pick up 30 Day Author. You can do that at kevintomlinson.com slash 30 Day Author. Um, but you can also pick up any of my fiction books from kevintomlinson.com slash books. There's all kinds of stuff available, uh, stories of all types that you might be interested in. I mostly write science fiction and fantasy. I'm actually kind of dipping into a whole new genre right now which I'll tell you more about later. So (laughs) enjoy that. Um, All that said and done, 
in advertisement. Now let's get into the juicy bits. Uh, this conversation with Garrett Robinson this is a great talk. I'm glad I could have him on the show. Um, I'm watching this guy's career and he's just skyrocketing. So congratulations, Garrett, on all you're accomplishing and on your number one fantasy bestseller status. And now, without further ado, Garrett Robinson, all about fantasy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And today I'm, I'm going to chat with yet another person that I met thanks to the uh, self-publishing podcast guys at the uh, Colony Summit back in 2015. And that is Garrett Robinson. He's a best-selling author and uh, YouTuber. Uh, which is not a term I can use very well, actually, Garrett. <laughs> Apparently, I'm going to stumble over that. He's the author of the number one fantasy bestseller, Nightblade. And you may have heard of that. I know I have. I've enjoyed it. So thanks for being on the show, Garrett. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to be here. You know, um, it was that event was, uh, it was kind of a turning point for me. I met so many people, and I've brought practically all of them on the show at this point. I think you're one of the few holdouts at this point. Uh now you're actually working with uh, the guys from Self Publishing Podcast, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's pretty fantastic. That was definitely um, the the summit was amazing, and uh, before right before that was when Sean had first approached me about uh, officially jo- joining Sterling and Stone. Right. But on that trip was when we uh, we met and we hashed out the details, and we've been publishing together ever since. So how does that relationship work? I mean, you you continue to write your books as you always would, and you know, what's their input in your process there? Yeah, so Sean uh, is basically right now working uh, kind of as my co-author, but it's a different it's a different uh, way than he works with any of the other guys that he writes with. Because when I came up with uh, when I came up with the idea for Nightblade, it's actually an idea for the entire world. The world is called Underrealm, mm-hmm. and there's multiple series in it planned out. Uh, Nightblade is just one series that sort of makes up a, a larger tapestry. It's actually kind of a a Marvel construction of a storyline where there are different people who have their own series, uh, like a Captain America comic book and a Thor yeah. comic book. And then there is one big, huge, epic uh, conflict in which they are all characters so that's your that's your avengers movie that's, or comic book yeah, it's like the civil war uh whatever all the different marvel conflicts that come up right something along those right. lines, secret wars and all that yeah so so sean and i aren't coming up with the story um together because because i already kind of know the broad points of the story but he is helping like i i write down okay here's what needs to happen in the next few books and I write it all out and I outline it and he goes through it and he comes up with ideas and suggestions and, and ways to improve it and um, how to make characters more interesting and how to make the plot tie together better. So, yeah, so then it's written and then he goes through it again, um, you know, uh, helping uh, fix language and make things tighter and more uh, gripping. And then, you know, I go through it again and then it gets edited and, uh, Sterling and Stone, of course, uh, does, uh, you know, the covers, uh, the publishing, a lot of the promotion and marketing, et cetera, et cetera. That's gotta be a huge help. I mean, that's the oh my thing God. that most authors <laughs> <laughs> struggle with the most. So has that yeah. been uh, kind of a life changer or what? It's been amazing. It's actually been really, really amazing. Uh, the, the, the ability to, I've been able to reach out and market sort of beyond my own means because right. before when I was literally doing it all by myself, you know, I could, uh, I, I, I couldn't really do much advertising, um, because it costs money, you know, right, um, right. I, I paid for my first book bub and that was, it was at, at that time it was very hard for me to do that. Um, and then, you know, Facebook marketing and, and all that sort of stuff, I could only I only had a limited amount that I could put into it. Um, Now, you know, now uh, that stuff is pretty much taken care of. And because it's, because it's a positive ROI, it's -hmm. not like it's uh, a, it's not a money sink for Sterling and Stone. It's just, it's that thing where you have to have money to make money. And when you can just pay the money in the first place, then the company makes a profit. I make a profit and, and everything's golden. Right. So, how, uh, you guys have kind of a almost like a publisher relationship at that point. Yeah, yeah, uh, pretty much exactly. Except that it's um, it's not it's like Sterling and Stone is the is the mothership. Yeah, but the actual imprint is Legendary uh, Books. That's our that's our imprint. And since I am 
a I, I'm a co-owner of Legendary with Sean. So it's like, yes, Sterling and Stone sort of is the publisher, but mm-hmm. it's like being the head of your own publishing company that that just belongs to a bigger publishing company. That's actually pretty cool. I, you know, I talk to people all the time who want to start their own imprints, and I think starting an imprint isn't that tough, but getting the sort of mojo behind it to make it work like that, that's where right. it, it would come in handy to have a Sean Platt and others. Yeah, uh, and the whole team, you know, having Amy to help run schedules and be like, hey, you haven't done this yet, and it's like, oh, thanks, thanks for reminding me. Yes. I just uh, think of that. And Maya to help with uh, web stuff, and, you know, uh, I'm on some of the podcasts now, and mm-hmm. Audra publishes those. It's, it's uh, boy, it's so much easier working with a team. Holy crap. Yeah, no kidding. And things have really evolved over there. Um, we, yeah. I, you know, I've had Sean and Johnny on the show, and then Dave kind of dropped out, but I, I'll get him. I'll get him on it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, things have changed kind of dramatically just in the past year. It's kind of interesting to see how that's all unfolding and see you guys, you know, see you get to be a part of it. That's interesting. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to expand uh, more and more, and just and just you know not spend so much time on things that we don't need to be spending time on. Like for right, right. now, I'm the Sterling and Stone uh, uh, compiler. I format the eBooks and the print books. Okay, but actually, right before we start, you know, did this call and started recording, I was in the middle of making training materials to teach someone else to do that because okay. I have. A bunch of books that I still need to need to do, but we're never going to stop publishing books. Right. But it doesn't make sense if we're publishing if Sterling and Stone as a whole is publishing a book a week or multiple books a week. It doesn't make sense for me to be spending up to five to ten hours a week formatting and compiling our print books when I need to be producing more more books for Legendary. You know, right? Well, and that's the way businesses work, right? I mean, you yeah. you learn something and you refine the process and then you teach it to the next generation of people who are going to do it for you. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Get it, get the system up and then get somebody else in there running the system. So what has that, that process been like? I mean, I think formatting books is something we kind of gloss over a lot. Uh, when you hear people talk about the, the business of writing, that's one of the few things I don't hear about very often. So what are some tricks and tips you can offer on that front? Oh boy, um, <laughs> we don't have to get too technical in it. I just you know, if you got something top of mind, you can throw. Well, it out first there. of all, Scrivener is a great writing program. It's mm-hmm. actually, and it's a it's a good um, ebook creation program. It is not good for creating print files, and neither is Word. That's and that's the two things I see everybody do. They create um, their book, their print books in Scrivener or in Word, mm-hmm. and it's boy, it's like uh, it's like trying to build a house with stone tools. I mean, you can do it. People did it for a long time, but we have better tools. And right. so if anybody, for, first of all, the best thing you can do is hire a print formatter and right. you can get one for you. Somebody can create a beautiful print edition of your book for a couple hundred bucks. Now for some people, a couple hundred bucks is, is kind of steep. Right. So if that's the case, get yourself Adobe InDesign because that is the industry standard. That's the the program everyone uses and if you're not using that you're making your job harder and and you just will not end up with a good enough product if you are using something else right that that is pretty much the uh that's the industry that's been the industry standard for a long long time i mean in the yeah. ad agency world that's been <laughs> the only thing anybody's ever used as far as i know maybe right. they use something like latex if they were a really low end shop Right. So, um, okay. So in design and now, uh, and I'll just throw it out there for people listening. You can actually get that for fairly cheap. If you get the monthly, like, what is it called? The, uh, creative Subs- cloud or. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can get individual programs for uh 20 bucks a month or right. 10 if you're like a student or whatever, but you can also just pay 50 bucks a month and you get every right. single Adobe program. So I have that and I have my video editing software, my Photoshop, my uh, audio software. I have everything. Yeah. Same there. <laughs> yeah. It's worth it too. Um, and I mean, Photoshop alone, man, I, yeah. and they update pretty regularly. So you've got oh, yeah. the latest and greatest. I don't like the current update in Photoshop where the whole recent activity thing, it doesn't work actually. I don't know. If yeah. you, have you noticed a problem with that? I've noticed that. Uh, I had I had not that problem, but I had a different problem where Photoshop like wouldn't open. But yeah. uh, and any pretty much any time I have a bug, it's either handled very quickly or yeah. I can handle it myself by uninstalling and reinstalling the program, right. which used to take 
when you had to buy the entire program, it used to take forever. And right. now it's through the Creative Cloud client they've got. It's it, it's it's pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's I wish, I wish Adobe would make a writing program. A writing program like Scrivener, but better than Scrivener because Scrivener is a great program, but it is they are so limited in their development by the fact that they their their business model like their right. business model is great for us as authors you pay 40 bucks the one time and you own it forever right. but they don't update hardly ever and right. so th they're really behind the times in terms of capability and and what i need as an author i always used to joke that if they would put spell check in photoshop i'd start using it to write and they then they did and um, i had to put my money where my mouth was and failed but the uh <laughs> <laughs> the uh if you're interested um i started using ulysses recently and uh um, oh, well, i'll check it out that's been my scrivener killer to be honest with you because i can i can do pr practically everything i did in scrivener you know you need to use markdown uh for formatting, but I I got used to that very quickly. So give that a shot. Um, so what about like how do you how did you learn what you're doing in InDesign? You didn't go to school for that, right? You just sort of trained yourself. Yeah, I've I've always been able to learn computer programs really easily. So uh, it's like I just on on everything from Premiere to Photoshop to everything. Uh, I just I launched in, and uh, the way that I approach any um, and anything that I want to do technically, whether it's Photoshop, video editing or whatever, mm -hmm. I find an example of somebody doing it the way I want to do it. Right. And then I just I, I bash my brains against the computer program until it does <laughs> what I want it to do. Right. Yeah. 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 And you know what irritates me? I'm just going to put this out there Adobe <laughs> and cause I'm hoping Adobe is secretly listening to this podcast and every oh, show that I put out. But the, the thing that irritates me about Adobe software is the fact that all the shortcut keys change between the different apps. Okay. So something I'm used to doing, right. and you, you know what I mean, right? Like oh, if I want a bold God. text, for example, uh, that one's going to change between apps. I can't do that. I can't use shortcuts in InDesign, for example. So that irritates me. Yeah, anyway. uh, my big one is I have a, a daily podcast, uh, yeah. which I record and edit in Adobe Audition, okay. which is it's it's a, it's a great program. It's just that in uh, Premiere, if you want to delete a clip yeah. and have everything shift over to fill the gap, it's um, option delete. Right. And if you want to do the same thing in Adobe Audition, it's shift delete. And if you hit option delete, it deletes your track. Right. So it's like, <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> You're right. The number of times I've just almost chucked my computer out the window. I think it's because they those all those pieces of software were acquired by right. Adobe through uh, from other groups. And they just never changed any of that stuff. So you like Audition. I tried Audition and didn't really like it that much. It's, uh, I, I used to actually work in a sound studio and okay. we used, uh, Pro Tools and yeah. there's no question Pro Tools is just a better program, yeah. but, um, I, you know, after I, after I left the sound studio and I was doing sound work on my computer at home, I couldn't afford, uh, Pro Tools. And so I had a pirated version and, you know, I, <laughs> right. I think we've all pirated yeah. expensive programs at one point or another. Yeah. And, you know, th like there were problems with it because because it was pirated. Like that's the, that's why that's that's honestly my main impetus to not use pirated software anymore is because there's a problem and you can't contact tech support. Right. So I, I moved over to Audition and now I'm about as comfortable with it as I was uh, when I was using Pro Tools. It's not it's still not as powerful an uh, like an application, but I'm paying for it. It's updating all the time, and and I can you use support. it to produce. And, yeah, exactly. I can use it to produce what I need to produce, and that's what it really comes down to. I mean, you got to find the tools that work best for your process, and then use those tools. Right. Um, so, okay, you're busy. I mean, you're like <laughs> <laughs> just just a little just bit. a little. You're like me, man. You get into so many different things, and I I can't follow everything you're doing. I. I see things fly through Facebook and it's like, I, you know, you redefine yourself day to day in my eyes, but how do you balance all of that? You've got YouTube, you've got podcasts, you've got, uh, you know, your books, you've got the stuff you're doing with Sterling and Stone. I mean, that's a lot, man. How do you do it? Yeah. Um, 
the the answer is that right now I'm not doing a very good job of balancing it. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, I'm behind w- my schedule. I ha- I set a personal schedule for myself for legendary for my writing this year. I'm behind on that. I have my YouTube channel. I'm supposed to produce a video every day. Theoretically, I can, but I'm behind on it. Yeah. Um, just getting into it now. And and the solution that I'm the solution that I am embarked upon right now is I'm starting to outsource. Uh, I have just emailed somebody um, about becoming my YouTube video editor because YouTube takes me about an hour and a half to hour hour forty five minutes a day uh, to make a video. No, no, that's not right. It's about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But 45 minutes of that is editing the video. Right. So if I can sit down, record a video and pass it to somebody in Dropbox, immediately I'm producing more content. It's only going to take them about 45 minutes. So if I'm paying them decently, it's not a huge daily expense. Right. And, and all of a sudden I'm producing more. I'm being more productive. Same thing on turning over compiling. I am behind on compiling things for Ster- for Sterling and Stone. There's books that simply are not available in print because I am trying to keep up with my writing. Mm-hmm. So by teaching somebody else and getting them to do it instead, there's only one thing that I do that nobody else can do, and it's my writing. Yeah. So anything else, and and that, boy, it's it's really, really tough when you're doing it all on your own. I am now in a position where I can outsource these things. And that, that just wasn't the case a year ago. And so everything was always behind all the time. And it was a, it was a huge source of stress. And now I'm able to offload that stress by offloading my work, um, and, and, and doing it fairly, not just asking people to work for me for free because you know, that kind of sucks. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I still try to get people to work for free. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I like that point though. Cause you're absolutely right. That's the one thing that no one else can do for you. Right. Uh, and so if you're going to leverage anything, you need to leverage all the other stuff. Yeah. And That's there's fun. things that I can do if I'm not worried about these things all the time. There's things that I can do creatively as the head of Legendary. Uh, one perfect example is uh, my book covers. Mm-hmm. Um, my book covers, uh, part of the thing of moving into the Sterling and Stone family is all of my book covers were redone because my original covers for Nightblade, I did them myself. Okay. I'm I'm proud of what I was able to achieve on my own. Right. But at the same time, they're not professional book covers. So right. Sean was like, we're going to get you new book covers. So they did, but I'm the only epic fantasy writer in Sterling and Stone. And my new covers are great. They're just not 100% what I want to see in a fantasy book cover. I right. want illustration. I want, I want uh, you know, like... Uh, I just want I, – I want a very specific look. Right. But I can't – until recently, I couldn't focus on developing that look. Like I, I just recently started looking for and reaching out to um, – like ser- searching out and then reaching out to illustrators and being like, hey, how about I commission you to do a cover? And so I'm going to commission a few different people to do to, – to redo a cover and whichever one – and they're all going to get commissioned. They're all going to get paid and whichever one I like best – will probably become the new cover illustrator. And then, and then that aspect of the business is a hundred percent perfect. It's the best iteration and I can just leave it alone. But even being able to reach for that a hundred percent perfect where I, where I like getting to that level, it's not possible when you're so mired down in the day to day. Right. That's, uh, you know, cover design is one of those things that I, I don't know. I can't let it go for some reason. And I like my covers. <laughs> well, I think my good. covers. Are... Yeah, you you design very very good covers. So yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the kind of validation I bring people on this show to give me. Um, so what about? Okay, now you're you said you're the only fantasy author with Sterling and Stone right now, or in the legendary. Um... Kind of. I'm the only dedicated. Like uh, Sean and Johnny obviously wrote Unicorn Western. That's a yeah. that's a fantasy, but it's not it's not. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a. It's a fantasy blend. It's a it's a, so it's a Terry fantasy. Pratchett kind of fantasy. Yeah, f- quirky, f- humorous. Yeah. I mean, it's it's called Unicorn Western. If yeah. anybody hasn't the series, that's exactly what it is. It is a Big Unicorn tip. Western. Yeah, exactly. It's a, and I, you know, I, I read the first one. Um, it's not my style. Like it's not it's not the kind of thing that draws me in. So I didn't go through the whole thing. I probably oh, man. I probably well, owe them. <laughs> you should give it. You should give it a shot because I'd say around because they're short. First of all, they're novellas yeah, yeah, and they're around cool. book uh, 
three or four, it starts to really like pluck at your heartstrings. And by the time you finish the series, you're like, oh my god, oh, so good. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah I'll check it's it worth out. A shot. Uh, I'm gonna jot that down. So, okay, do you um, do you write? You don't write novellas or serials right now, really, do you? No, I, I so. used to write everything serialized. Yeah. In fact, when I published Nightblade the first time, it was serialized, and then I realized, um, wh- well, one, it's a shitty business model right yeah. now, and two, um, I it was uh, it was a little bit restrictive like i can still have a cliffhanger every 3 or 4 chapters but the the um the requirements to have a cliffhanger at the end of every episode yeah. limited me in what i wanted to do with the story i sometimes i wanted to uh take things a little bit slower sometimes i wanted to take things a little bit faster yeah. and splitting it up that way um it i some people can probably do it better, but I don't think it lent itself to the type of fantasy story I wanted to tell. Right. Right. Yeah. So I got rid of that. And now, uh, nothing that I, nothing that I have out is, is serialized anymore. So what, what is making that a bad business model right now? Well, Amazon, you know, doesn't, uh, and, and the other sites as well. Um, if you are serializing a novel, I think it's, um, I think it's pretty crappy to charge more than 99 cents for an episode. Right. And if you're charging 99 cents for an episode, you're making half the money that you would if somebody buys it in the bundle. So if they're going to buy it in the bundle anyway, then why do you have the episodes? Unless you're going to mark the episodes up to 2.99, but then that's pretty crappy. And it's just your your reviews get split. You mm-hmm. can have a bunch of reviews on episode one. That, that happened on Nightblade. Nightblade, the first episode, got upwards of like – actually, I – I think that's still up as like my uh, lead gen. Uh, Nightblade is uh, like so it's got like 250 reviews. Right. Holy sh- is what I wouldn't give to have those reviews on Nightblade, the actual book itself, because right. that's where I drive my marketing. You know, I hmm. would rather have it, it. The the first book has 150 reviews. If you combine it with the 250 reviews from the episode, that'd be 400 reviews. Yeah. Holy cow, that would be amazing. But I yeah. don't because. You know, they're I wonder if you could, uh, you know, Amazon's usually pretty good about if you contact them, they'll connect two books. I wonder if you can make a case for it. Like it's, it's part of this book. So, you know, can you, <laughs> you no, know, you can have different versions, you know? Yeah. But I think I, I, I would, I would, even if I had a, like, I think that wouldn't happen unless I had a rep, but even if I had a rep, I wouldn't want to do that because I'm the type of person who actually looks at and reads the reviews. I don't just look at the score, right? Most mm-hmm. people just look at the score, but some people get in and they read the reviews. And if they're seeing all these reviews for like, oh my gosh, this is just a, this, uh, what a great snippet. I can't wait to read the full book. Right. Then immediately they're going to be like, whoa, wait, what? This isn't a, and, and even if they, sort it out and and overcome the confusion you never want to give them a confusion that they have to overcome right yeah that's true yeah remove all the stumbling blocks <laughs> exactly so is uh sterling and stone are they going to be adding more dedicated fantasy authors like you or is that just kind of let's see what happens as we as we grow well legendary we're billing legendary as our fantasy yeah age. i keep saying sterling and stone I, there's too well, many that's... names with these guys man <laughs> <laughs> It's well, a Sterling legendary. And Stone, yeah, Sterling and Stone's the 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 mothership, and right. legendary is billed as our fantasy imprint. Realm and Sands is more um, sci-fi oriented, and they they delve into some other stuff, but it's mostly sci-fi. Um, but Realm and Sands's uh, brand is we write what we want, and that's mm-hmm. cool. They have an audience that loves to read whatever they write. Right. Um, legendary, like I have written other books that aren't fantasy. And if those did get moved into Sterling and Stone at some point, we would not put them in Legendary because Legendary is the fantasy imprint, right? Okay, all right. So um, the idea is uh, – the short answer is yes, we want to bring in other authors at some point. It's mm-hmm. just not going to happen in the near future. For one thing, I need to catch up. Like that That's, again, one of those like forward-thinking, long-term planning things that I can't do while I'm trying to catch up with the current schedule. Cause right. we're actually, um, we're releasing a book a month in 2016. Yeah. Uh, so that I, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. I feel you, man. I'm going for a book a month this year. Yeah. I'm behind already. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're already at the end of the month. I, I gotta get busy. Uh, 
So, okay, how does the YouTube channel factor into sort of your overall marketing plan? Does that is that meant to be a marketing tool for your books, or is it an entirely different animal? Oh no, it definitely is. Um, it I I uh, had a uh, I had a podcast that I did on YouTube called the Storytelling Podcast, and uh, we we broadcast it live on YouTube. And I ran into a time period where uh, my that that podcast eventually died. We we canceled it. And it was it, there was a long period of time where you know first this co-host couldn't make it that week, and then this one couldn't, and then neither one of them could, and then I couldn't because I was starting to lose my my like dr- like when you're really into something, right. you don't you don't miss it. You know what I mean? You don't right. miss days. You, know, you you got the you got the bubonic plague, and you're like, I'm fine. Let's do the show. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and, and so I kind of got to the point where I was like. Uh, feeling like I wanted to do something, but I just wasn't necessarily feeling the podcast so much anymore. And I guessed it on somebody else's podcast, a good friend of mine, Buddy Gott. I don't know if you know yeah, him. I don't know him personally, but I follow him. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's cool. And, uh, he had me on the, on the show and he was like, man, you know, I, uh, I wish you made more. I, I wish you like, I wish the podcast were like there every single week because I like I really like listening to it. And, you know, if you had a new episode every day, I would uh, I would totally uh, listen to it. And I was like, huh. And I decided I thought like I didn't really think I was the first person to ever do this, but I didn't I didn't know much about YouTube. I was like, I could just make a YouTube video every day about my writing. Mm -hmm. So I started vlogging thinking that I had thought up some new thing <laughs> and a couple of Surprise. weeks in, yeah and a couple of weeks in somebody was like you remind me of hank green and i was like uh, who's who's hank green <laughs> so i found his youtube channel and from him i found people like hannah hart and wheezy waiter and right. um just all these all these people and uh and i was like oh my god youtube is amazing so i started <laughs> i started aping their styles and i started making daily vlogs and everything so part of the impetus of youtube and part of why if somebody's like, I wonder if I should start a YouTube channel, my answer is yes, always, every time. Because if you can, if you can bear to have a YouTube channel, if you can stand it, you will be, you will be one of like five percent of authors who are even willing to try it. Because let's face it, most authors, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of shy, we're kind yeah. of introverted, and I've never had that problem. Yeah, so, me neither. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> Most people, the idea of turning on a camera, talking into it for five minutes, editing that down, and then putting it on the on the internet for for people to actually see, like yeah. that's just terrifying, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I uh, so I started doing it, and and part of the great thing is when you're working on a book, even when you're working fast like we do, like okay, we want to put out a book a month this year. Right. That's still a month of working on a book. And getting no feedback. Maybe you got some beta readers. Maybe you have a partner. But, like, you don't have audience response. Mm -hmm. And YouTube, you sit down and in an hour and a half, you've banged out a complete product that you can put out there and you start getting interaction. Right. And that's so valuable because it it satisfies that need of, of, uh, I don't know, validation is the right word, but just, just interaction. Like, we all want to interact with with people who who are interested in what we're doing mm-hmm. and um and actually i i talked about this in a video i made for my uh patrons on uh, patreon but i realized recently uh yesterday actually that i had forgotten that aspect of it i started adopting the the too precious attitude towards youtube where i didn't want to make a video unless it was better than any video i'd ever made before <laughs> right. and that's not why i use youtube and that's like if the the best example for most writers is blogging if you don't ever want to write a blog post unless it's the best blog post the internet has ever seen. You're not going to blog ever. You're right. just never going to write a blog post article. Right. Um, and the same thing goes for me in YouTube. I, I, I do it to just vent or just put something out there that people can uh, interact with and enjoy. And as long as I keep that attitude about it, my YouTube channel goes great. And when I forget that, my YouTube channel, I, I miss videos. I don't do this. I don't do that. And um, and so it is a marketing thing for my uh, my books. But it's also like it's a creative release. 
And because I have set up a Patreon for it, it's another source of income. And I think diversifying your income is just really, really important. Yeah, especially as things just continue to immediately change. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, I actually, I have I have a YouTube uh, <clears throat> pathetic uh, channel that I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was actually keeping it up for a while, but I, I dropped out. It just became more work. And uh, right. I think that's the, you know, I got the same problem you do where how do I balance all this crap? But now you're inspiring me. I'm going to have to go back and dust that thing off. And I don't yeah, know if I'm going to be able to do it anything daily, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially if there's editing involved, but maybe I can just yeah. chunk something up there. So are you seeing a lot of uh, transfer from that though to your Oh, to for your sure. Books? Yeah. Whenever I, whenever I release a book or I say it's available for pre-order, or now it's out and you can go get it. Um, I obviously, I email my email list. I post it on social media. I post it on YouTube and each of those, every place that I post it, I use a different affiliate link so that I right. can tell where, where everything's coming from. Right. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so I can like YouTube actually converts it. How do I put this? It converts better than my email list, um, okay. based on views. So, but here's the thing about YouTube. Uh, if you, if you, um, if you send your email, right. Uh, and let's say you have, uh, you know, 3000 people on your list and, uh, 25% of those people open it, right. Uh, or, or 30% or 35 or like, you know, like I, I I'm up at around 40 usually on, on my open rates. Right. So, YouTube has changed their algorithms the way so many social media sites do. So I have like 2,500 subscribers on YouTube, just under 2,500. Mm -hmm. But when I put out a new video, it usually only gets about like 10 to 15% views, like a couple hundred, a few hundred views, unless it goes viral for some reason I can't really control. Of those people who actually watch it, the conversion rate is great. Um, it's just that the way YouTube puts out your videos people aren't necessarily going to watch it. You know what I right. mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which is unfortunate for a website devoted to helping people watch videos. Um, well, their design, they, they are, I mean, the thing about YouTube is they are dedicated to people staying on the website, right? right? So they push to people who they know are already popular and they push content with long, that, that keeps people watching for a long time. Right. So a daily vlog uh, that sort of thing. And with somebody who only has a couple thousand subscribers, they don't push as hard because why would they? Because, you know, there's I'm a few small. million other people out there. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I had promised you we'd wrap up uh, kind of quickly. This is a little shorter than usual for those listening, but I think they got all the really golden nuggets out of this one. So, uh, people can follow you. Well, they can catch up with you online at Garrett Robinson.com, right? That's your website. It's Garrett B. Robinson. Garrett B. Robinson. Some, com. some father has owned Garrett Robinson <laughs> since I started my online career. And he, mm. he made a website for like his like 10 year old son at the time. And yeah. he's never done anything with it. There's no, it's just a page and I'm so irritated. I've tried to get that website. Look, but, there's yeah. a lady who owns wordslinger.com. Oh no. And she's been sitting on it. And right now is it's pointing to her dog, whatever her dog product is. Oh, and no. she will not let it go. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so she's saving it for her daughter or something. So yeah, I feel your pain. Uh, okay. Garrett, I practiced that before I ever even called you. Cause I knew that was a thing. <laughs> Garrett B Robinson.com. I tell you what, if you're listening, you can just click in the show notes and you can find that. You can also find the link to his YouTube channel. If you look up the Garrett Robinson on YouTube, cause he is, he gets the article. Uh, because of all the hard work he does. So, Garrett, man, thanks a lot. Uh, don't let him kill you over there at Sterling and Stone, man. You got I know you're busy, but you got to keep it. You got to keep it oh, all I, real for the readers. I adopt. I, I bring all <laughs> my own work down on my own head. Like, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Say hi to all those guys for me. Everyone else, stick around for the wrap up. I'm sure I got something really witty and pithy to say, and we'll talk to you next week. Woody and Pithy. There I go putting pressure on myself. Now I have to perform. So <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that interview with Garrett Robinson. Um, he, you know, there are so many people I'm, I know because of the self-publishing podcast, guys. And uh, and I'll be honest, you know, I even sort of got into po podcasting it, you know, in general because I listened to their show. And, uh, you know, 
I, I'll put it nicer than, you know, if those guys could do it, I could do it. But <laughs> it did sort of wake me up to the idea that I could do this and there's uh, there's value in doing it. So special thanks to Johnny, Sean, and Dave of the Self-Publishing Podcast. Once again, these guys get more mentions on my show than I think they get on their own. Um, so that was Garrett Robinson. I hope you'll check out his work. His fiction is fantastic. Um, you know, and I'm not typically a, a fantasy reader, but I do enjoy what he's writing. He's got... He's got a very um, clean style, we'll say. I don't know. That may not be a good way to describe that. He, I like his style. It's it's not uh, grungy, down in the dirt kind of stuff. It's more. Um, there's lots of, lots of thought behind it. <laughs> so does that make sense, Garrett? I'm sorry, I kind of just butchered that whole thing. But the point here is, go check out his work, um, and you won't be alone. Number one fantasy bestseller, man. That's that's something to aspire to. I mean, that's like Tolkien status right there, right? So. Um, That said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. One more quick uh, admin thing I just want to mention. Once again, uh, if you are enjoying the show, if you like what you're hearing and you are getting something out of this, um, I'm looking to up the game. I want to help other people get even more out of Wordslinger. And uh, you can help with that by helping to support the show financially um, through Patreon first. That's the first way to do it. And if you go to wordslingerpodcast.com and click on the Patreon logo, um, no matter where you are, really, you'll find that on wordslingerpodcast.com. You can, uh, and you can also click on fund me, which goes to the same exact page from the, uh, from the, uh, menu bar up top. And you can give as little as a buck a month to help support the show and move me toward my $5,000 a month goal, which will help me with producing the show with, uh, you know, growing it. Uh, you know, that there's a lot that will come out of that. So, I appreciate your help for that. Uh, I would love to make this show financially self-sufficient. And, uh, you know, it helps justify my time when I can kind of pay myself for my work. I actually, I don't know if you know this. Maybe most people don't know this. But I bill myself for time that I spend on things. <laughs> and I do it primarily at the advice of my financial advisor who said I should do that for tax purposes, uh, which is interesting. I had never thought about it, but it makes quite a bit of sense. I do the work um, I would pay someone else to do. And if I paid someone else to do it, I would uh, take a tax benefit on that. So, <clears throat> kind of stands to reason, I guess. So, it's not huge. It's not a not a lot, um, but it does help. If nothing else, even if I don't get a tax break, uh, I am able to estimate what my overhead is, and it's quite a bit more than I thought. <laughs> so, um, you know, just in terms of time, at least. But I want to appreciate. I want to show my appreciation to all of you who are already supporting the show either through Patreon or through purchasing my books. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You are uh, a godsend, actually, because without you, what's the point of even being here? Um, And uh, 30-Day Author is another great way to help support the show. I haven't determined the percentage yet, but I have determined that I'm going to take a flat percentage from from each sale of 30-Day Author and count it toward um, the, uh, the revenue stream for... Wordslinger podcast, since I do advertise that quite a bit here, and it does fit with my audience. I've got another book coming up called 30 Day Podcaster, which if you have ever wanted to start a podcast of your own, you may be interested in. Um, and I feel like after after being the host of three podcasts and uh, helping a few people start podcasts of their own over the past couple of years, I, th- I think I'm qualified enough at this point to at least write about it. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so take care of yourselves out there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Oh, uh, one more thing. In April, April 21st through 24th, the Northeast Texas Writers Organization, NETWO, is having a, uh, a, a writers conference in the, the Dallas area. Uh, you can find them online. Uh, just search NetWo. Uh, you are to be able to find it with no problem. But <clears throat> and if you can't, let me know. Um, I'll be happy to. Maybe I should put a link in the show notes. I'll do that. I'll put a link in the show notes for NetWo. Um, however, go check that out because I will be there uh, from the 21st to 24th. I believe the 21st. I'm, I'm arriving on the 21st. Now, whether the conference starts that day, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> so I'm arriving the 21st through 24th. And I'll be speaking on the uh, the future of publishing and how the indie author fits in that model. I'll also be doing a live broadcast for the Self-Publishing Answers uh, podcast with my co-hosts, Nick Thacker and Justin Sloan, who are also going to be speaking at the event. And you won't want to miss that. It's going to be cool. So, And if you're not already a subscriber to... Um, 
self-publishing answers podcast please check it out go to spapodcast.com where you can pick up back episodes uh you can also subscribe on itunes and stitcher uh speaking of itunes and stitcher please review this show and spa if you don't mind and uh creative writing career which i do with (laughs) justin sloan and and stefan bugai um but definitely rank and rate this show and give me a nice review it helps me to become discoverable to other listeners and uh you know that's always a good thing that's a good thing for all of us really so thanks so much for your support in every single way even just listening to the show whether you ever give me a dime or not is fine by me as long as you keep listening so and keep sharing with uh with other people so take care of yourselves this is a short episode we're only at like 45 minutes i don't think i've had an episode quite that (laughs) That's short. It makes me want to keep talking for 15 more minutes. But uh, no, I'll give you a break. So take care of yourselves out there. I love each and every one of you. I'm so grateful for every one of you. God bless you, and I will see you next week.